Hello and welcome to all of you joining us for the second of the Japan Studies Association's Staying Connected webinar series. Although the COVID pandemic made it impossible for us to gather as usual in Hawaii for our annual conference, through the wonder of Zoom, we realized that it was possible to gather and enjoy each other's company with a series of presentations furthering the mission of the JSA. Before introducing our speaker today, I need to thank my program co-chairs, Andrea Stover and Maggie Ivanova, uh, and of course, Joe Overton, JSA president, for their assistance bringing this concept together. The board of the JSA, Stacia Bensel, Bay Beecham, Jim Peoples, and Dawn Gale also provided much help and advice. Uh, a double shout out to Dawn Gale for helping us get support for our program from the University of Kansas Center for East Asian Studies and hooking us up with Jody Dietz, coordinator of Johnson County Community College's Collaboration Center, and Sarah Bayos and Isaiah Reesby, who handle the technical aspects of our program for us. Thanks much to all uh, and to all of you for joining us today. I'm willing to bet that this is not the very first webinar for most of you, but they still begin jeopardy by reminding people of the rules. So in that spirit, I'll briefly run through our program today. I'll introduce our speaker and hand it over to Elisa in just a moment. Elisa will talk for about 35 minutes or so, and then we'll open it up for comment and discussion. If there's a question you're just dying to ask, please submit it via the chat or question functions, and I'll put them to Elisa. Also, feel free to use the chat function to keep in touch with your fellows. Private side conversations are definitely encouraged. One of the most fun aspects of being program co-chair of the JSA conference is the new friends that we've been able to make. And that's certainly the case with Elisa Freeman, professor at University of Oregon. Her interdisciplinary work investigates how the modern urban experience shapes cultural production, gender roles, and human subjectivity. She has served as the resident director of Oregon University's Study Abroad program in Tokyo and as director of undergraduate studies for East Asian language and literature. She also recently concluded a stint as Northeast Asia Council Chair for the Association for Asian Studies. Through her use of literature and visual media, Elisa's investigation of delightfully ordinary things in Japan has managed to provide us deeper understanding of its society, politics, and economics. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Elisa Freeman, who will talk to us today about Japan on American TV. Please take it away, Elisa. Thank you so much, Paul, and thank you for, thank you for that kind introduction, and, and thank you to the JSA for inviting me. It's an honor. I'm going to share my slides, and if you can give me a thumbs up or let me know if you can see them. Are they showing? Can you see the slides? Not yet. How about now? I can't Great see. Enough. Let me try this again. Uh, Zoom always has. Um, I, I don't have the screen share. It's disabled right now. OK, let's talk to Isaiah and see what he can do for us. Or I could just act out the samurai on American television. That would be <laughs> I could act out the parodies though. Let me try this again. Here we go. I've got it now. There we go. Yay. All right, I only you. have uh, a lot of slides for you all. Um, thank you. Those of you who know me too know that when I get excited about something, I tend to talk very quickly. So please feel free to slow me down and I'll try not to take too much time, but I have a lot that I would like to share with you all. Um, and if you have a question at any time, please ask. My point today is um, I'm going to talk a bit about a different side of Japanese studies, namely how American television from the 1950s to the present reflects an alternative history of American fascinations with and fears of Japan. I, um, during the pandemic, I've written a book that will be published in uh, June 2021. And I wrote this book to be accessible, affordable, and teachable. This is not an advertisement for the book today. I'd be happy to tell you more about, about the book. Um, but today is introducing the project of which the book is a part. But I wrote this book uh, to explore the political, economic, and cultural issues underlying depictions of Japan on American television comedies and the programs they inspire. So this book is about programs made in the United States and I provided a TV watch list and I'll try my best not to spoil the TV programs for you. But um, I'm interested in how um, American television reflects mainstream views of how America's negotiating Japan's role in US daily life. This book has its origins in three different ways. I've presented it in my classes to various groups of students 
to Japan societies, to, to scholars that are more interested in the semiotic views that I take. And in fact, the book cover was designed by my student. I had a student who kept doodling during my Zoom class in the spring. So I asked him to design the book cover. So um, this book is largely thanks to a lot of student input. So today I'll present a pan panorama of ideas rather than deeply dive into one example. And I won't talk about all the text on the slide, but the text is there if you'd like to look at it or look at it later. And um, I'm looking forward to your questions and I'll try to keep my talk. I may go over 35 minutes. It may be more like 40, but I will try to keep things brief. Again, a shout out to my students who have made suggestions and shared their ideas about television. I'd like to begin with some questions. When we stop and think about images of Japan on American TV, what can we learn about both countries? Should we take TV, especially television comedies that are meant to be entertaining, seriously? Does analyzing TV comedies make them less fun? Well, my answer to the last one is no, I think it makes it more fun. But since the start of regular television in the 1950s, US programs have taken on the roles of curators of Japan, displaying and explaining selected aspects for viewers. A belief in the United States hegemony uh, underpines this view that um, many countries, uh, global television, like United States television presents the view that the American view is generally right. Even while poking fun at America, we still learn a lot about how our national values are constructed. Um, television can take subversive views as easily as, as fine arts, for example, or novels because of reliance on mass audiences, advertisers, and other reasons. So I'll bring this slide back at the end, but um, in my project, I take a historical perspective to understand the diversity of parodies about Japan. And I've broken this into six main categories of TV portrayals, and there are overlaps and fissures but these also represent different comedic forms. So my book is less about the audiences of television than looking closely at these programs and what the characters say about how America is processing different views of Japan. Um, so instead of merely presenting a catalog of stereotypes, I examine how TV depictions of Japan are constructed within a nexus of discourses, those occurring in the mass media, those occurring through social debate, and those also constructed by a history of television broadcasting. And I'm interested to hear Paul's view having worked in television, about television. So um, primarily I've designed this project to be teachable. And I, again, it's not a compendium of things that are wrong with television. In fact, I'm a big Marie Kondo fan. And um, in analyzing her program, I've learned a lot more about her. But instead, I'd like to suggest an academic way how knowledge of Japan helps us explicate media meant for entertainment and present new ways of using uh, knowledge of Japanese studies. I also hope this project provides a gentle way of approaching issues that are difficult to otherwise discuss, like racism, cultural essentialism, cultural appropriations and to shed light on uh, national branding. So my book and my project raises the question, can Americans have fun with Japanese culture or other national cultures without advancing racist and sexist tropes and beliefs in American hegemony? And we'll answer that together. But um, my book focus focuses on parody. I don't look at all programs about Japan. I'm particularly interested in comedies. And a parody um, broadly defined is a cultural work that imitates or appropriates an existing text or an individual style for the purpose of comedy or ridicule. And a parody only works when we know the, uh, um, the subject may, uh, well enough to get the joke. Like for example, in the scene to the left of the Simpsons go to Japan from 1999, if you don't know that that is Godzilla, you might not understand the joke. So jokes cement communities and they show the extent of knowledge of Japan in the United States. I believe that parody too also makes com possible competitors less powerful by making them the butt of jokes, by making them laughable. And in these programs about Japan, it shows how different Americans are from the Japanese people they interact with rather than strikingly similar. And these programs are different from satire, which is um, sort of using comedy to encourage hatred, if you will. So American series depicting Japan expand definitions of parody to include hegemony or the political power dynamics underlying parody. 
So as I'll show, many of the jokes involve portraying Japanese people and Japanese culture as incomprehensible, threatening, adorable, or small. And in most of these skets, sketch, uh, sketches and stories, American characters interact with Japan and try to make sense of, of the people and things they're interacting with, even while misinterpreting them. And part of the joke is how Americans get things wrong. But Japan is defined by and made re immediately recognizable through colorful and often childlike versions of its historical figures and international exports from samurai to Hello Kitty. The shrouding historical memories of violence, economic tension, and war that percolate beneath. So these programs are not entirely harmless, and but they risk for they risk offending and othering international cultures, and they dredge up hurtful public memories. Historical violence lies behind their humor. This is apparent in the first part of my project, which explores stereotypes of the judo instructor on early American television. And again, I apologize for some of these racist images and my, my students, unfortunately, have to put a line on the syllabus that the syllabus might ruin some of your childhood favorites. I don't intend to I'll pull, pull things apart to put them to back together in new ways. But um, TV cartoons by Hanna-Barbera, I don't know if any of you've watched them, um, especially from early television in the 1950s, were among the first US programs to parody Japan. And this parody was accomplished through the figure of the judo instructor, which combined, as I'll argue, racist stereotypes with the popularity from Asian martial arts and coalesced in this figure that you see pictured here to the left. This is Judo Jack from Pixie and Dixie and Mr. Jinx, or um, Joe Jiu-Jitsu from Dick Tracy. The judo instructor that um, adopts this awful stereotype of Japanese men from World War II, of being short with buck teeth, with big round oversized black uh, framed glasses perched on pig-like noses that mispronounce English R's and L's and start a lot of utterances with sounds. But the judo instructors are interesting to me because of the first international characters to appear on American television. Like the stereotype of Japan has been ingrained in viewers. And notably, these same Heart of Barbera cartoons were among the first American programs to globalize in Japan. So I'll skip over a lot of this wordiness, but I'd just like to outline a few key points that these judo jacks, to borrow the term from Pixie, Dixie, and Mr. Jinx, the cartoon from the Huckleberry Hound show, show Japanese men as shrewd business people as Japan recovered from the war and was re-emerging on the international scene uh, as an exporter of technologies and as a junior US ally. They sold myst mystical aspects of Japan rather than cutting edge technologies for which Japan would become later known. And Hanna-Barbera cartoons, they interact with Americans who are trying to demonstrate their ability to protect themselves, their families and their money. A question I ask is why did this negative awful stereotype of Japan from wartime propaganda persist in 1950s cartoons for children who were growing up in a very different media scape that showed Japan as um, a very different image of Japan than the wartime uh, stereotypes. I think part of the stereotype was due to the um, project, the cartoon creators who had created wartime propaganda, but it also shows persistent sort of racialized views of Japan in the American cultural imagination. So to illustrate this, um, again, I apologize for these images, but these are two anti-Japanese propaganda films during World War II created by Disney and Warner Brothers. Disney actually became part of the US Army efforts. These cartoons were not necessarily made for children, but were made also to be shown to the US military to boost morale against and, and to encourage hatred, not just against Jam Japan, but against Germany. But the portrayals of Japan were especially racialized. In the top image, we see um, Popeye the Sailors, you're a sap, Mr. Jap. And at the bottom is um, the incredibly offensive Bugs Bunny nips the nips. But you can see the stereotype image here. It, um, Theodore Geisel, Dr. Seuss, drew anti-Japanese cartoons. And I apologize to my students for ruining their childhood. Uh, Horton here's a who, but you could look at the faces from anti-Japanese um, propaganda comes back in Horton here's the who, which Dr. Seuss based on his visit to Vera Geisel, based on his 1953 visit to Japan as part of a diplomatic mission to assess the role of American style democracy on Japanese children. He wrote um, Horton Hirsuhu in 1954, and some of the faces reflect the Japanese stereotypes.
Another reason the stereotype was becoming pro, uh, was proliferating in cartoons was because judo was becoming popular in America. And uh, the first uh, ju time judo was included in the Olympics was in 1964. So um, I don't know if any of you have seen, I, it, one of the tough things in lecturing on Zoom is I can't see the audience, so I can't know how you're reacting. But um, I included this on the TV watch list. Some of you may have seen the Flintstones episode from 1960 that features Professor Rakimoto pictured to the right. Um, the Flintstones was the first cartoon aimed at adults, the first to have prime time viewing slot, and the first to be in color. And essentially the Flintstones is the American series, The Honeymooners, done in cartoon form. And in uh, Fred Flintstone is a working class man who is very frugal and he wants to protect his family and his family finances. And in the episode about the prowler, um, Bedrock, the town they live in is being faced by a prowler and the families take judo lessons to protect themselves. And Fred Flintstone's very skeptical about this. He doesn't want to spend money, but through a series of gags, he accepts the idea. And he's paired in a way with Professor Rocky Moto and they're foils for each other as two men just trying to earn a living in 1950s America. But we see how Professor Rakimoto adapts this awful stereotype of Japanese men. And when Fred Flintstone greets Professor Rakimoto, he says one of the only English words that are only Japanese words that many Americans knew, sukiyaki. And my students asked, why didn't he say Fujiyama? But sukiyaki was one of the only words along with geisha girl and Mount Fuji that many Americans knew at the time. But Professor Rakimoto gets the last line and says that earning money is not just whistling Dixie. So I'm going very quickly through these examples, but I just wanted to point out that these cartoons sort of coalesce um, contemporary 1950s view of Japan. Like the Sakamoto Q song, the album picture to the right, he was a singer that um, topped the, well, the very first song to top the American music charts was a song named Sukiyaki, and that was not the Japanese title. The song has nothing at all to do with food. Sukiyaki is a meaty Japanese dish with the right amount of exoticism to blend uh, to seem Japanese, but to fit the American palate. So again, these cartoons are circulating at a time where Americans, generally speaking, are fascinated with Japan for cultural reasons. Zen Buddhism, sukiyaki, judo, things that seemed exotic and sophisticated. This uh, racial stereotype persists also um, becomes more notorious the following year in 1961 with uh, Mickey Rooney doing this awful yellow face in uh, Breakfast at Tiffany's. And I don't know if any of you have seen the Gilligan's Island, the American sitcom episode from 1965, So Sorry, My Island Now. I talk with this about my, with my students and we parse out the stereotypes, but it stars um, Vito Scotti, an American character actor in yellow face playing a Japanese soldier that was marooned on islands. So I'm going to speed up a little bit, but chap, the second part explores uh, the late John Belushi Saturday Night Live parodies of Samurai Futaba. And in the 1970s, 1960s, another prevalent image of Japan was samurai through various news stories like Mishima, author Mishima Yukio's um, samurai suicide in uh, November. Paul, yes. Sorry, it was just a, keep going. Oh, okay, uh, right. questions are well, welcome. <laughs> but um, to outline some, some news stories uh, that were related to samurai images in the United States, but um, Nishima's um, suicide was regarded in the international news as more extremism than valorization of the samurai. But art house film showings of samurai epics like Kurosawa's films that were remade into a Hollywood versions like Seven Samurai Became the Magnificent Seven. Picture to the top right is the actor Mifune from who starred in, in many um, Kurosawa films who comes to epitomize ideas of samurai masculinity. But the American television show, excuse me, Japanese television shows that are shown in the United States at this time were not about samurai, but were usually either anime that could be easily local, localized. Um, like Astro Boy was the first Japanese program regularly to be shown on American television or Candy Candy or Speed Racer later. These programs that blended into a landscape of um, American uh, cartoon offerings, but showed uh, high technologies robots rather than samurai. Or another program that globalized were tokusatsu or this kind of pseudimation that was enjoyed for its campy value. 
But the Samurai parody, Saturday Night Live, I don't know if any of you have seen the first season of Saturday Night Live, which is a classic. But Saturday Night Live in this context ran 16 par uh, four minute skits starring the late John Bellucci as a samurai living in New York City, who's working in various jobs, just trying to make a living. And Saturday Night Live could take more risks than other American programs. It could be more topical. It was shown at night. It, um, it was in the beginning of cable television was trying to compete with network television. So it was trying to be edgier. But Samurai Futaba is a parody of Mifune's intense acting style. Futaba, um, upholds honor, he grunts unintelligibly, and he performs tasks with his dagger and his katana that awe his customers. Unlike the outsider hero of samurai epics, Futaba is integral to New York City, and he's able to communicate with his customer, who is played by Buck Henry, mostly. And part of the gag is the physical humor of John Bellucci, but also the fact that Buck Henry is speaking English and Futaba speaking Japanese and they perfectly understand each other because they're two working men. If you see pictured here to the left is a segment called Samurai Delicatessen. And uh, these sort of scribble to the left are supposed to be Japanese kanji characters. So it's not real Japanese. But a segment that's my favorite of the series is called Samurai Big Man on Campus, in which um, uh, Buck Henry plays D uh, Dean Bidem and Samurai Futaba is failing out of his classes. He even fails the easiest class on campus, which is Asian studies, where you could get a C just by knowing Asia on the map. So um, Futaba takes his katana and slashes off uh, the top of the globe and hands it to Dean Bynum, who changes his grade to a C. But in um, all of these episodes, these skits didn't feature Japanese cultural things, like the kimono are tied wrong, um, Futaba's ponytail looks more like a hippie ponytail than a samurai chomage. It's a parody and the things that are destroyed are mostly icons of daily life, like some Japanese television are the only, it's not a destruction against uh, Japan, but it's more sort of um, using the samurai as a parody of tough guy masculinity and to workaday men trying to make a living. Um, Again, uh, this samurai parody appears in other segments in the 70s. And I put these all on the watch list of uh, the Swedish chef versus the Japanese cake from the Muppet Show. But um, this is not, um, I'm not going to go into this much today, but I don't know if any of you watch Shogun, so influential, thanks Paul, in, in 1980, which presents a very, very different portrayal of samurai. But again, the same kind of essentialized view of Japan as a land of samurai. And in fact, this became such an important text that it was drawing students into Japanese history classes in the 80s. And Professor Henry Smith uh, wrote a guide to teaching Shogun in the American classroom. But um, there are other problems to Shogun too. It was the only Japanese uh, US miniseries filmed entirely in Japan and in Japanese. The decision was made to include the scenes in Japan as um, characters like Mifune speaking Japanese to show, to show how the foreigner character felt disoriented. I could talk more about this during the Q&A. I just want to bring up a corollary to my, sa my samurai comedies. But um, the punchline of the comedy is um, that the warrior, like Samurai Futaba, the violence in this comedy comes in perhaps taking, um, reducing the samurai to a series of physical tropes and to erasing the historical significance and making the samurai into a symbol or a metonymy of Japan, as Shogun also does. But appearing at a time when Japanese products were being sanitized for international consumption, these characters did not encourage audiences to reflect on American provincialism and prejudice like later animated sitcoms and Saturday Night Lights skits did, and I'll talk about that soon. But to better understand this paradigm shift, it's helpful to analyze Big Bird in Japan, a gentle parody that demonstrates the evolving role of Americans in explaining Japan and softening its international image. I don't know if any of you have seen Big Bird in, uh, Big Bird in Japan. I just taught it to my class last week. And uh, I'm so glad someone raised your hand. Um, this is a program that's near and dear to my heart, but it was shown in Japan before it was broadcast in the United States. And it's based loosely on the 10th century tale of the bamboo cutter. Um, which is a Japanese folk tale about a, a baby who grows up to be a princess who is trapped in a piece of bamboo. And the, the, the main line of that story is she's really the princess from the moon and she's trying to get back to the moon. You can hold that thought as we talk about Big Bird in Japan. 
But since 1969, Sesame Street has influenced global television, global children's culture, world politics. The main idea of US Sesame Street is multiculturalism. And often world cultures come to Sesame Street rather than Sesame Street going other places. But Sesame Street has taken a large role in um, performance styles. It uses a lot of comedy, um, cross-media promotion. And in 1971, Sesame Street became the first American program imported in Japan to teach English. But in Sesame Street's not an English language program. The Muppets speak super fast, faster than I do. The people have New York City accents. But part of the selling point of Sesame Street in Japan was seeing the English, uh, New York English being spoken. Sesame Street was the first program on American television to feature a multi-racial um, cast, and it was banned for one month in Mississippi, and notably Jim Henderson's home state for this reason. But Sesame Street didn't feature Asian American characters until 1990s when um, the actor Alan Moroka uh, became the new proprietor of Mr. Hooper's grocery store. But pictured here to the left is Sesame Street in 1969. You can see Oscar the Grouch is orange. The characters change. Sesame Street constantly uses testing and research. Um, Sesame Street brightened here in uh, 2018 in the bottom right. You can see how Sesame Street has changed. So the change also came through the globalization. But Sesame Street has used a striking amount of parody, uh, especially for the adults that are watching the program with their children or with children in general, and uses a lot of celebrity appearances. But Sesame Street was created in large part uh, in response to the violence of Hanna-Barbera cartoons, like uh, the ones I just showed you, and other aspects of children's television in America. But over the decades, Sesame Street has shown various images of Japan, uh, in part through their agenda through cultural diversity and global marketing. Um, but Big Bird in Japan aired against the background of um, Japan bashing in the late 1980s, the anti-Japanese rhetoric, anti-Japanese violence in uh, the late 1980s that was spurred on by Japanese corporations buying American property, by the horrific murder of Vincent Shin in 1983. Um, he was murdered during um, a, a sort of a, the American auto industry was suffering from, uh, in part, the Japanese cars were becoming more popular, especially after the oil shocks in the late 1970s and showing failures in the American automobile industry. And um, all of these, I, I wish we could go more into this context. I'm going very fast, but my point is that Big Bird in Japan aired on American television against this other news. And it was also at a time where the American generation who learned about Japan learned about business models and, and a, a, a bubble era Japanese economy. The book by um, the late Ezra Vogel, Japan is number one from 1979. The Japanese popular culture in the United States at the time, um, there was more Toyota cars arguably or, or um, Sony electronics than Japanese popular culture in the US in the 1980s. And Sony electronics, for example, had names that blended into the American marketplace, like the name Sony. Some people say named after Sunny Boy. Um, big, uh, the Sony Walkman coming out in 1979. But Big Bird in Japan was, was broadcast before a lot of Jap uh, American youth were consuming Japanese pop culture on the niche of being from Japan. But Big Bird in, in Japan was inspired by the only other time Sesame Street went abroad, which was their visit to China. And that was filmed in 1983 before many Americans could visit China. And uh, because Big Bird and Barkley enjoyed their trip to China so much, they go to Japan and Big Bird is looking in his guidebook and he really, really wants to see wooden paper houses. And he's becoming a bit obsessed with looking at this classical image of Japan. But they're left behind on their bus tour because they are one minute late. And those of you who have been to Japan know that bus guides are the butt of jokes in Japan of people who are obsessed with punctuality. So they're um, left behind and Big Bird's goal is to get back to their tour so they can recatch their flight to go back to Sesame Street. So while trying to return, they meet up with Kagoya Hime, who notably is the name of the princess in the tale of the bamboo cutter. And she's played by an actress who has starred on many NHK programs using English. Um, 
Kawakami. So together, Big Bird, Kawakami, uh, Kagayahime, and Barkley experience new things and old customs. They sing a lot of songs about Japan. But like other episodes of Sesame Street, Big Bird in Japan teaches an emotional lesson to have courage and be open-minded. So Big Bird in Japan and Big Bird in China, again, were the only time Sesame Street traveled abroad. In most cases, other cultures came to Sesame Street. But Big Bird in Japan was filmed in location in Japan during the bubbly economy era and shows scenes of Tokyo consumer culture. But the focus is on the pastoral, on finding classical image of, of Japan to contrast to the stern images of corporate Japan that are being shown in the news. For example, Big Bird, as I said, is obsessed with finding these pretty paper houses and tiny twisted trees. And they sing a song too about going to Kyoto. They're going to take a photo of days long ago. To. But you could just, you get the idea of Big Bird is presenting a softer, gentler image. Notably, it was also produced to promote Sesame Street in Japan. And pictured here is the localized Sesame Street that Sesame Workshop pressured Japan to create for various reasons. You might not recognize all of the Muppets like pictured to the upper left, that's not Little Bird, that's Arthur who does a Japanese comedy routine with Pierre the Frog. But when New York was erased and, and English language was removed, the, product, the program could not compete and Sesame Street failed. But what's interesting is the Muppets become freed of Sesame Street. And I ask my Japanese friends, why do you know Elmo but have never watched Sesame Street? So Muppets begin to advertise things from donuts to um, broadband internet in Japan. So um, another example, I have three more examples to show you. Um, situation comedies like The Simpsons, all included in the 1990s and early 2000s episodes about Japan. Um, the Simpsons put Fox Network on the map. It resuscitated the animated sitcom, which had failed in between 30 years uh, after the Flintstones. And it made Japan look cool, but it did not totally accurately use Japanese culture. The Simpsons, I don't know if any of you have seen The Simpsons, but it's like Fred Flintstone. Homer is a patriarch who's trying to protect his family and his family finances. He's outsmarted by his daughter, Lisa. His accomplice is his son, Bart. But notably, Lisa and the women, Marge, are absent when they get into a lot of trouble in Japan. But um, pictured to the left is an episode, The Simpsons has featured a few episodes about Japan. And it, this is, Homer finds his image on a box of detergent. And if you notice, if you speak Japanese, you notice that the power clean is spelled wrong in Japanese. It's shown here as hawa clean. So it's not totally accurate, but it's presenting an image of Japanese popular culture. This is Simpsons and King of the Hill and Futurama and other series that the Simpsons made possible were airing to arguably a TV audience that was beginning to consume more Japanese popular culture, like Pokemon cartoons pictured to the left. Uh, here the notorious um, calling these onigiri jelly donuts or Toonami began in 2001 to show Japanese anime or Sailor Moon was resuscitated on American television by fans of Japanese popular culture. But notably, these episodes about Japan, even though they're all airing to audiences of Japanese who are familiar with Japanese popular culture, show two things. They present Japan as being incomprehensibly different rather than comfortably familiar. This functions as a plot device also to bring the families on the programs together. They unify trying to understand Japan, but it also implicates Japan. Um, there, they implicate history, historical memories, especially of World War II. My question is, why does World War II keep coming up in American animated sitcoms? So you could, we could discuss more examples together during the Q&A, but this is a notorious scene in the episode where the Simpsons go to Japan in 1999. And um, it, the characters are provincial people from small town America. Sim the Simpsons live in Springfield, Oregon. I know other Springfields have claimed Springfield, but it's Springfield, Oregon. Matt Groening, the creator, is from the state of Oregon. And uh, they're in Japan, and in Japan's the antithesis of everything unusual. And it mobilizes the trope of the ugly American tourists. In a pivotal scene, Homer throws a sumo wrestler into a, uh, has a fight with a sumo wrestler and then throws the Japanese emperor into a barrel of sumo thongs. You cannot show the Japanese emperor in popular media in Japan. 
You cannot throw the emperor into a barrel of sumo thongs. That, so that episode was not able to be shown in Japan. But in response, this, uh, Bard and Homer are thrown in jail where they learn um, origami. They perform the play Chushingura and they're waited on by geisha. And they learn satori, which is translated the Zen concept as the secret of inner peace. So this is presenting a very sort of Zen image. It's making fun of Japan through this pastiche of gags, but it's showing Japan as uncomfortably different and implicating war memories. Here's that scene of the emperor that Homer throws into the barrel of sumo thongs. And this happens again in King of the Hill. They, uh, uh, Cotton, the grandfather, wants to spit on a picture of the emperor. And if you notice these pictures of the banners when the family lands in the Tokyo emperors say emperor on them. King of the Hill, this is the only double episode in the entire 13th season um, series was when they called returning Japanese where the family travels to Japan, where Cotton, who's a war veteran, you can't wear an army uniform on a plane but he uh, returns to Japan and I don't want to spoil it for you. The last episode that I talk about, and again, I could bring this back, I'm going rapid fire through a lot of things here, um, is South Park. And the creators of South Park, Trey Parker was a Japan major. And he intentionally manipulates Japanese kawaii or cute aesthetics and has his four children on South Park do subversive things while looking very cute. And in this episode, Chin Pokemon, which translates loosely as penis Pokemon, created by the Kony Corporation, um, uh, sort of uses that the children's faces actually become a uh, Japanese kalmoji or face characters to the episode. But South Park episodes about Japan engage with war memory. And uh, as I mentioned, they use kawaii aesthetics to intentional ends. And um, I'm going to skip ahead, but the format of many episodes of South Park, a media trend or news event happens that captures the imagination of the South Park community, setting off a series of absurd events. And the children often have to explain these events to the adults. And the episodes about Japan, of which there are about, at least about eight of them, have done two things. They revolve around the theme of Japan taking revenge on America for World War II and parody American media. In each case, the four children explain Japan to Japan and to Americans. And this, this episodes are cross cut between Japan and the US, which is something you could do in animation that you can't do in live action. So one prime example is Whale Whores from uh, 2009. Angry mobs of Japanese people are slaughtering whales and dolphins. They even go to Miami Dolphins football game and attack because it turns out that the picture of the plane that dropped the bomb on Hiroshima was um, piloted by a whale and a dolphin. This was an image according to South Park that the American military circulated after World War II to uh, get the, a peaceful cooperation in Japan. So the South Park children visit Hiroshima and get, present the prime minister of Japan with a new picture of the plane piloted by a chicken and a cow. I apologize for the offensiveness of this, but you can think about why these depictions of Japan are going on. And here's the Japanese emperor according to South Park in the episode of Chin Pokemon. So again, one last point that these depictions of Japanese political figures and war memory sort of reaffirm the idea of Americans as victors, Japan as vanquished. And um, they inspire, they do not advance, these uh, programs don't advance Japanese government policies or reflect on historical trauma or global uh, flows of culture. That's why I think the teacher is important to come in and explain these programs to students or else the, the um, potential gets lost on viewers who just get so caught up in one thing happening rapid fire after the next on a program of South Park, for example. But in chapter five, which is my favorite chapter in the book, I turn to a program that I think presents an instructional lesson for teachers to listen to students. I don't know, have any of you seen these Saturday Night Live skits from 2011 and 2012? J-pop America fun time now. And again, um, yeah, I'm glad you've raised your hand. I show these to my students and watch them squirm. These are, um, they're offensive. And my, my book is a, about how offensive a lot of these American programs really are. But these programs acknowledge that um, in these programs are fictional Michigan State University students who love but misunderstand Japanese popular culture. And it's very meta. They produce a TV program for their school television network. But their faculty advisor, who they call Sensei Mark, Mark Hoffman, 
needs to be on the set as the show airs. So the two students are very exuberant. They use Japanese language wrong. They put san at the end of their own names. They sing strings of made up Japanese words or use Japanese words incorrectly. In the back of their stage set are words that are spelled wrong. I think they tried to write the word tel telebi for television, but spelled it wrong in katakana. But Sensei Mark dampens their, he, he's constantly saying, reminding them, you're my worst students. You're my loudest and most obnoxious students. And he's trying to correct them and trying to you know, say, this is just a cartoon portrayal of Japan. But um, in each episode, they invite a guest. Katy Perry plays the Royal Empress of the Michigan State University Hello Kitty Appreciation Club. And she presents them with a figurine of the Chinese basketball player making fun of American conflations of Chinese and Japanese people, um, the endurance of the samurai stereotype. But again, in each episode, Sensei Mark reminds the television audience and the students themselves that um, they're not being correct. And he says that their program rides the boundary between homage and racism. As he says, if, this, if there is such a loving thing, a loving version of racism, I think you have found it. And I think that's a very provocative statement I've discussed with my students. But what's also lost is the program presents a hierarchy of who has knowledge about Japan. Like the students um, respect Sensei Mark and want to learn from him, but the verse is not true. He does not learn from the students. And Mark's credentials are based on his um, educational credentials rather than his fan knowledge. But he loses the opportunity to engage his students in a larger con uh, conversation about the popular culture they're consuming. So the students never realize the dangers of what they're doing. Like Samurai Futaba and the characters on animated sitcoms, they don't learn cultural lessons from their mistakes. But, um, and I'm not going to tell you the punchline, but in the very last skit, according to the tagline, the students have become the masters. I'll let you watch. So um, I believe that these series have pedagogical value and have prepared American audiences for more diverse portrayals. And in the 2010s, I believe that television networks are beginning to acknowledge that their fan base has a wider knowledge of Japan and appreciation of Japanese culture in various forms of Japanese culture. Have any of you watched the Netflix series Tidying Up with Marie Kondo? I, I hope you have. Um, maybe you've heard of Marie Kondo. Um, Maria Kondo is the person I investigate in the last chapter of my book. She's a best-selling author, skillful entrepreneur, and media-savvy cultural influencer who has successfully established a transnational career. She lives in Los Angeles with her husband, who is the CEO of Maria Kondo's own company. And I, in my book, I argue that she has interpreted ideas of the ideal Japanese woman, the Yamato Nadeshiko for American audiences in her Netflix series. So uh, Maria Kondo pictured here is doing her, she's a tidiness guru. And in the series, she visited eight carefully selected California families that are chosen to represent the diversity of people that Komari, as she's called in Japan, Maria Kondo's Komari method of tidying can help. She does this gesture in her program where she shows, it's her cute gesture of showing, I love mess. Maria Kondo has a degree in English from Japan, but she speaks very little English on her program. And she has notably become the very first person to ever become a household name and celebrity around the world by speaking English on American television. In fact, her Netflix program has been broadcast in countries where Netflix is not allowed, including, um, Unfortunately, Myanmar, which is having a lot of difficulties right now. But Marie Kondo, as I mentioned, is known as Komari in Japan, an abbreviation of her name. She created a, a kind of method of tidying based on Japanese common sense, the kind of thing Japanese school children learn, how to fold, for example, clothing, common sense. Um, she did work in a Shinto shrine at age 18, but she also um, uses a lot of Zen rituals. Um, her method is trying to teach people how to own things more mindfully, to um, feel more grounded in their daily life by having a living space that is more tidy so that they can have better relationships in their other uh, parts of their lives. So her method is based more on mindfulness than it does on minimalism. In fact, Mary Kondo has a very large online store. So she's not trying to sell you the idea that you should own less. You should just own things more mindfully. 
In these images pictured here, we see Maria Kondo's best-selling book that was translated into English before her program in 2015. She quintessentially wears very soothing colors, especially white cardigans. And a cardigan over a shirt, like I'd be dressed improperly if I were doing this talk in Japan, I should be wearing a suit jacket. She sort of wears a jacket over her shirt to show she's sort of in a business setting, but yet is informal enough to go into houses. But she was dressed in kimono when she received the honor of being chosen as Time Magazine's one of the women of the year in 2016. So again, presenting this image of a demure idea of what a Japanese woman perhaps should be. She also has cultivated a whole troop of Kolmari consultants um, to, to teach her method. But her Netflix program was based on a little known NHK, Japanese public television mini series called Tidying, Tidy Up with Komari Explanation Point. And the Netflix series was bought from the entire, Netflix bought the entire series without um, using a pilot. It was competing with Amazon and other streaming providers. So it was a rights to series show. And it was unscripted but highly edited that combines aspects of American reality television series. It's not a comedy, but I believe that some of the tropes I've talked about, views of Japan, have paved the way for American audiences to appreciate this kind of view of Japan that also cutifies Komari and uses tropes to uh, understand her. Like for example, this trope we see in the Flintstones of Americans engaging with Japanese people and trying to explain what they're doing. But she visits these California homes and, and through the program also teaches lessons about her method. Tidying up with Cole, uh, in her method, she also does this kind of ritual when she enters a home to show an appreciation for the living space and um, for the setting she's about to tidy. And this ritual that she does sort of has been expanded into Netflix as part of Komari's um, view of presenting a certain view of Japan. But again, she lives in California. She has a lot of control over her entrepreneurial image. And her media, as I argue in another project I'm working on, um, Komari, her media in Japan mobilizes her Americanism, like in photographs that circulate in her Japanese Instagram. For example, she shows a lot of public displays of affection with her family, looks directly into the camera. But notably, one last point I'd like to make before we open this up, and I give some concluding remarks and we open things up, that um, Maria Kondo does not learn from her clients. Um, and she remains sort of set that her way is the right way, as we see in a lot of these television programs of not learning from each other. That, um, like, uh, for example, in the Saturday Night Live skits on J Pop America Fun Time, now that pedagogical potential is lost. Another program that aired at the same time as uh, Marie Kondo's Tidying Up with, with Marie Kondo. I don't know if any of you have seen Queer Eye, we're in Japan, explanation point. It's worth watching. This is the Fab Five, um, the reboot, Netflix reboot of the program Queer Eye for the Straight Guy from the early 2000s, in which five um, openly gay men who each have a specialization help a local person to improve their lives through tidiness. And they visit Japan in a, the only other time that the program has gone abroad was a short that they made um, uh, in Yass, Australia. Because a word that the Fab Five use a lot in their program is Yass for yes. So Japan is the only time they did a, a series and it was filmed in location in 2019 and incorporates some transnational um, Japanese celebrities with transnational careers like Watanabe Naomi who's pictured um, in the middle here. But the point here too is this interaction between people in these programs. The Queer Eye Fab Five are good intentioned, but they um, sort of don't understand the local color, local atmosphere and the problems that the people are facing. Each episode tackles an as aspect of ja Japan in the global media. I could go on and on and I've already talked your ear off for what, 45 minutes now. So I'm going to wrap things up, but I gave you a watch list of other programs you could watch. One of the worst American television shows ever. I don't know, if, has anyone seen Pink Lady and Jeff from the year 1980? Thank you for watching that. That stars the well-known Japanese pop duo Pink Lady in a television series with Jeff Altman. The gag is Pink Lady doesn't understand English or America. And Jeff Altman needs to explain things to them and they all end up in a hot tub. Or I Survived a Japanese Game Show, episodes of Portlandia and Shake It Up, pictured here. Beavis and Butthead, also the only country they ever visited. 
uh, besides Mexico is Japan. They try to change the American exchange student to make it them as dumb as they are. So this is a slide you showed before through this romp through American television comedies and the negative portrayals that lie behind them. Um, again, this is not a catalog of everything's wrong. My point is pedagogical that by explicating the mythologies and beliefs underneath these television portrayals, we can learn both about America and Japan. But America has sort of take, I showed you these example programs to understand change, how American television has negotiated changing patterns of globalization and perpetuated national stereotypes while verifying Japan's international influence. One of the most positive changes has been the diversification of Japanese characters and their acceptance on American television. And I could keep this slide up later or bring it back, but I just wanted to emphasize that these depictions of judo jacks, screaming samurai, tourists, anime clubs, tidiness experts show that TV parodies and the earnest shows they have inspired present an alternative history of America's fascination with and fears of Japan and show how America has negotiated changes in Japan too. Television as a form of entertainment meant to comfort and amuse doesn't present solutions to pressing social concerns, but yet by analyzing them, we can learn a lot. And again, I'm emphasizing this pedagogy. So my book and my project asks us to quote, take a second look, and I'm quoting um, my colleague, Jan Bardsley, who read a draft of my book and said it better than I, I can in many ways, to take a second look at our favorite TV shows, not only per, per, uh, questioning the portrayals of Japan, but the TV depictions of cultural and history more broadly. So thank you very much for bearing with me through all these slides. And I hope you do look at the TV watch list and take a look at some of these programs. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elisa. Really appreciate that. Um, so um, folks, feel free to you know put forward questions either through the chat function or through the Q&A. We have one um, here already. So uh, Carl Gabrielson. Uh, asked, does your book engage with Asian American perspectives on the representations of Japan in US media? Excellent, excellent question. You know, I thought about it and I started researching the topic and I realized when I was writing the book, my not to say that that's a perspective that shouldn't be, I think someone should write that book, but um, my book, I do touch on it, but to keep my, my book grounded, I look more at the programs and the audiences, but you're absolutely right. And I'm writing a separate paper about Asian American responses to Sesame Street. And I'd love to hear more potentials about that because I think that's a really important perspective and I've read a bit about Asian American community responses to the program Shogun, for example, in 1980. And I, I think that's a topic that really should be delved into. Thank you. For well, that one of the things that I recall um, Bill Tatsui talking about um, many years ago was the way in which um, the gendering of the way in which Japan was portrayed by uh, American mass media from kind of the, the post-war geisha to the more masculine samurai of Shogun to once again, a more feminized. And I'm wondering if that kind of ties into what you've been seeing in all of this. Absolutely, thank you for reminding that. I don't know, Paul, have you seen the John Belushi Godzilla skit from 1977? Uh, yes, yes. I may also, have actually seen that live at the time. <laughs> because I'm, I'm going to answer your question through the late John Belushi and I'll come back to the point. John Belushi plays Godzilla in an interview with Gilda Radner playing Baba Wawa, her parody mm -hmm. of uh, Barbara Walters. And John Belushi is playing Godzilla as sort of a tough guy mess. In fact, he's hitting on Baba Wawa during the show. It's all these sort of tropes of um, sort of a stereotype of a certain kind of masculinity by showing Godzilla as being sort of this Oh, American man in the 70s. Mm -hmm. so this kind of gendering of Japan happens, like I, I'm very interested in the 1950s of this resuscitation of the offensive trope from propaganda that doesn't use a lot of, I haven't seen very many geisha tropes mm. in television. I see a lot of sort of judo instructor tropes, but I, I also see a lot of Warner Brothers cartoons of troping masculinity rather than doing uh, or stereotyping women in secondary roles. Mm. So I think Marie Kondo has done a really amazing job in sort of bringing more Japanese women into American television. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. I, I love Bill's point about watching Godzilla as a child and growing up and, and reflecting on Godzilla as being a child viewer. Mm. And also to follow up, another thought occurred to me about looking at audiences. One challenge I've had in my TV project, and if anyone has any insights, I've had trouble getting television reception. Like I can go back and I've tried to mm. dig up old Nielsen ratings. I don't know if you remember back in the day, they would send a form and the family would fill it out what you're watching this I've week. I've been in the Nielsen family four times in Anchorage. <laughs> yeah. It's, I mean, that it's not totally accurate because the family could be like, oh, I'm so embarrassed. I was watching Hanna-Barbera cartoons. I'm going to write down. I was watching Masterpiece Theater. Um, my, my book also deals with more middle row of television rather than the higher um, brow. But the, what I've relied on to get at that question too of how Asian American communities have been viewing, I've looked at some newspapers that are primarily circulating among certain communities in Los Angeles, for example. I know that's not a full sampling. So I've been limited in that respect. Mm-hmm. So uh, um, Albert Wong also poses a question. Uh, Americans have pretty negative images and impressions of Japan. Do Japanese have similar negative reactions to Americans? I love that question. That's what, the book I want to write is uh, Japanese images of America on American television. Uh, mm-hmm. That's actually very diverse. And I've been researching that. Um, in the 1950s, when Japanese television is starting, some of the first programs that were purchased were American programs like Leave it to Beaver or the Huckleberry Hound show that I showed mm-hmm. you, the Pixie Dixie and Mr. Jinx. And um, there's sort of an image that these are from America and these programs could be enjoyed in Japan because they have the cachet of having American technologies, American daily life. But there were also some, like there was a famous Japanese um, duo, Fujita F. Fujiko, um, who created Doraemon, the Japanese mm-hmm. anime. I don't know if anyone has seen Obake Q Taro um, about the ghost. Yeah. There's an American character on that program from the 1960s, Dorompo. Mm-hmm. who is a big fat pink ghost with an American star, blue star on its belly and red American stripes who plays the dumb American. He's from Texas. The ghost is originally haunted from a, t- a, a house in Texas who drives a big car and eats hamburgers. So I think there are American stereotypes or um, in the 1980s on, Amer- on Japanese television dramas at night, when you wanted to show sophistication, you had sort of blonde white Americans walking in the background. Mm. You see this, for example, on the television show, Tokyo Love Story from the 1990s, 1990. Mm-hmm. So there's various um, interpretations. One, the ca- um, Japanese programs like Astro Boy were purchased because they were cheap in America and they could fill American broadcast schedules. Well, the American programs that went to Japan had a different value. Mm, indeed. So I'm sure you're setting yourself up for this to be just kind of bombarded with, well, what about this show or what about I that? I love that. That's my favorite part. That's, yeah, that's, that's why my, my so, TV list gets bigger and bigger. And so what I've been thinking about is there's actually an early episode of, I think it's an early Sam Waterston era episode of Law and Order. Ah. where the defendant played by Laura Linney um, is a woman who had spent time in Japan uh, working in a hostess club and she's on trial for shooting one of her former clients, uh, a Japanese man in New York. And Japan never actually appears in the episode and yet it's essentially Japan is on trial during the episode. So I think that's also a very fascinating look at our kind of our perceptions of that. Excellent point. I was just talking with my class the other day about the episode of Mad Men, two of them, where the um, the workers from Honda come to Mad Men and ask me about advertising campaigns. Mm-hmm. And the character from Mad Men who has the, the Zen office with all sort of Japanese artifacts. Mm-hmm. I keep seeing these tropes. Thank you for the law and order. And I just saw a, a horrible episode of Twilight Zone too, with early episode with George Takei about Japan. <sighs> I don't know if you've seen that, Paul. Yeah, I've I've probably seen it. I'm I'm not having much success. Well, I do recall there's an episode where um, young Dean Stockwell uh, suddenly is kind of transformed into a young Japanese uh, army officer in the Philippines in 1941, and this you know gives him some sympathy for that. Also, actually has Leonard Nimoy in it as well. Oh wow! (laughs) Um, so. Another, it's interesting, 
when we are thinking about portrayals of Japan, one of the things that tends to get lost, I guess it's been lost into the, the pop culture wilderness is um, 1986 or 87, um, it's a Ron Howard film with Michael Keaton, Gung Ho. Gung Ho, yes. Yes, a set in an uh, American auto plant that uh, the Japanese company is coming in. Mm -hmm, yes. Exactly. And so, and once again, that also gets us, you know, at some point, you know, the, the war comes up. And so that history is, it seems to be very difficult to transcend. Interesting about the making of Big Bird in Japan that it's against this awful rhetoric of Japan bashing and also at the same time where Japanese people are, are coming to the U.S. to work um, in the Honda plant for example what was it in Ohio mm -hmm. or um, the Toyota plants and these cars have names that blend into the American landscape like Toyota or Honda Accord, Toyota Celica and the car used in Big Bird in Japan is a Toyota Celica even though the name is carefully removed. Mm -hmm. so it's it's also reaching various audiences mm -hmm. and the growth of Japanese studies as a field in the 1980s of people who are interested in economics. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Well, you know, we're part yeah, of that kind of that impulse. So uh, Carl Gabriel, Gabrielson uh, asks, do you have thoughts on depictions of sexuality, like either the abnormal perverted stereotypes promoted on shows like 30 Rock or the yeah. sexless trope that appears on Queer Eye and Jim Jeffries? Wow, you are an encyclopedia of television. I love your, and I, and I ask if anyone has seen this, Carl, you keep raising your hands. Thank you for that. Please email me these, these suggestions too, and, and you can write the sequel book. You're absolutely right. And that's something I wish I had explored more in the book. And, and you're right, these characters become tropes too of, of certain ideas of Japanese otaku. Or, mm -hmm. or avid fans of Japanese popular culture or stereotypes of Japanese nerds, the, the asexualized Japanese character. I don't know if you've seen the episode of Queer Eye where in Japan where um, the Queer Eye Fab Five is trying to help, this is episode two, they're trying to help a young um, oh, uh, out gay man in Japan. And the Fab Five, I'm not answering your question, but I'm, I'm trying to negotiate how American television has dealt with these tropes. The Fab Five is trying to coach this young Japanese man to be out loud and proud. And the Japanese man is responding saying, no, I don't think I could do that in Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a country that one doesn't look fondly at people who are proud. It's a country that values more subdued modes of expression. Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult to be a young gay man in any country, but let alone in Japan. Mm -hmm. So in so saying, that's a program that tries to tackle the issue, although I'd like to think of it as good natured. It's a bit misguided and probably should have done a bit more research. But mm -hmm. you're right, we have these other programs that just gloss over these issues and put the character in. You can think of episodes um, starring a lot of uh, like a lot of Japanese American characters get cast into characters who are having arranged marriages, for example. Like what's mm -hmm. the episode of Happy Days from the 1970s? <laughs> with Pat Morita having an arranged marriage uh, with a Japanese bride being sent. Or the episode from The Simpsons where a comic book guy has a Japanese bride. So you see this trope, you're absolutely right, this sort of over-sexualized, um, asexual, or this trope of Japanese people having arranged marriages mm -hmm. coming up, but not being discussed or being discussed in ways that don't fully acknowledge the diversity and various sides of issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much, Carl. Thanks for raising your hand about all these programs. This is a book that, that you should write. <laughs> so Sarah Aptalon, um, thanks you for a wonderful presentation. She says, speaking of meta, I also saw of Larry David's depictions of the Japanese country club owner with a pet swan that Larry accidentally kills and Japanese restaurant owners on Curb Your Enthusiasm, which he loves. As oh, that's awesome. Rick, angry, harsh and aggressive, not to mention mysterious. There's a funny scene about the too shallow bow that a Japanese restaurant owner makes to apologize to Larry for an unsatisfactory order. Later, a Japanese man in the park tells him that it was a shit bow, insincere because the restaurant owner didn't know bow deeply enough, more nuanced and self-aware, but still jarring. Thank you. I have not seen that episode. I'm now going to watch it. Thank you for sharing that. It shows how persistent these stereotypes are. Mm. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. The, yeah, the bowing also gets accentuated in those 1950s programs too, um, Professor Rakimoto and 
Yeah, thank you for sharing the curve your enthusiasm. I, that's one I did not know. And, well, so I'm also, it would be interesting to see kind of a continuum of to what extent are these parodies truly informed by some actual knowledge of Japan, which gets us in, you know, to talking about, you know, Trey Parker. Trey Parker. And South yeah. Park. South Park is super offensive. It's one of the most offensive shows you can watch, but it, it does a lot with Japan, and, and that's to Trey Parker's credit. And he even brings on his Japanese roommate from University of Colorado in, in some of the early works that he did, who became an animator for Pokemon. <laughs> Trey Parker uh, is offensive about Japan. I don't know, has anyone seen the Chin Pokemon episode? I resisted talking about it, mm -hmm. where he has another episode about Tweak and Craig in which he, he takes on boys love media, or Princess Kenny, a reoccurring character. Um, but Trey Parker is making fun of Japan, but he also knows, he has the cultural literacy, the ability to read Japanese culture to make his parodies more nuanced. Mm -hmm. So, and one, I guess one last point I'd, I'd like to make is um, when you're talking about The Simpsons, I always like to contrast The Simpsons with uh, Crayon Shinshan, if you're familiar with him. I mean, both simultaneously um, parody, satirize the family unit, but also valorize it uh, in a really strange way. So there are both uh, interesting ways to get into um, both cultures, I think. That's an excellent example. I was thinking more like the Korean Shinchan is a perfect example. So Zai-san also less, less, than, less parody than Korean Shinchan perhaps. Mm -hmm. but, um, What's interesting, the same thing happened with Bart Simpson has happened with Elmo on the Sesame Street uh, mm -hmm. in Japan. Sesame Street failed as a Japanese program. It was taken off the air on NHK um, after several experiments. It appealed to an audience of people who had mostly spoke English or had lived a certain part in, in America. The localized Sesame Street was not up to the, it could not compete with the landscape of Japanese children's culture, but then Elmo becomes more famous. Same thing with The Simpsons, Japanese cable networks like Wow Wow uh, aired some of The Simpsons, but the jokes just failed. Mm -hmm. People in Japan didn't understand the cultural literacy needed to understand the provincial gags. Mm -hmm. But Bart Simpson then becomes this free floating character. And I'm bringing this up all because I remember way back when the CC Lemon campaign was happening, um, uh -huh. Bart becomes a spokes character for a Japanese lemon drink called CC Lemon. Mm -hmm. And you'd see marketing along with the same kind of usage that Crayon Shinchan would have mm -hmm. in marketing the product, this sort of bratty kid on uh -huh. the board, or the bratty kid acting out against his family. Mm -hmm. So, well, um, Thank you so much oh, um, you. for all of that. Um, we've come to the end of our time. Aww. So thanks once again to Alisa, to members of the JSA board, to Dawn Gale in particular, and Jody Dietz, Sarah Beos, and uh, Isaiah Riesby of the JCCC CoLab and the University of Kansas Cease for their support. Our next program will be March 17th, uh, 3 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, 9 a.m. Hawaii Standard Time. Professor Ethan Siegel of Michigan State University will join us to discuss 311, 10 years on, reflections on Japan's triple disasters. A decade after the massive earthquake, tsunami, nuclear disaster hit Japan's northeastern coast, to what degree has that region recovered? What lingering issues remain unresolved? What is the significance of the triple disasters for Japan and the world? Even after 10 years since those tragic events, ongoing problems continue to pose challenges for people in the region. Based on numerous site visits and interviews with residents, Ethan's talk reviews what happened in March 2011 and explains why it took so long for certain issues to be resolved. It also looks at some of the ways that the triple disasters are being remembered, addresses the complex topic of nuclear power and safety, and highlights a few of the lessons that scholarly research has revealed. So information on that and the rest of our program schedule can be found on the JSA website, japanstudies.org. Thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, have a wonderful day.